So welcome to the Innovative Discovery Series. Um, this afternoon, um, we have some special announcements. So for CME credit, you must, with a capital M-U-S-T underlined, sign in, in the back, right? And you must include your email and credentials. Everyone knows the drill. Uh, don't miss our uh, July 20th ID series. We will have a special guest, Dr. Hillary Barnes from the University of Delaware, who is going to be speaking on nurse practitioners and healthcare delivery, a program of policy focused outcomes research. Please register so you can help us prepare and have the right amount of food, because we know it's all about food. Okay. Um, also on September 6th, we will have a tech talk with Dr. Wei Jin from the University of Delaware, and our full schedule is posted on our website, de-ctr.org. This afternoon, I am very excited to introduce to you Dr. Susan Burkhoff. Uh, Dr. Burkhoff is a nurse scientist at the Christiana Care Health System. I believe she started in January um, of this year. She is also an adjunct pediatric faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and a clinical nurse at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Burkhoff earned her PhD from Villanova University where she studied mobile health tracking technology at Penn Medicine. And her professional background includes lots of stuff. <laughs> Neonatal, cardiac, and pediatric critical care, pediatric critical care flight nursing, pediatric radiation oncology, adult and adolescent mental health, as well as nursing education. She is passionate about helping patients manage their health, wellness, and chronic conditions through innovative digital technology research that includes the adoption, use, and sustained engagement in order to make a meaningful difference in patients' self-care and quality of life. As we know, mobile health, so we've heard a lot about apps and Uber and virtual medicine and new models of care delivery that all incorporate technology. And so Dr. Burkhoff is going to talk to us today about um, one particular study that she did on the usability and acceptability of a patient-centered mobile health tracking app among a sample of adult radiation oncology patients. Thank you, Dr. Burkhoff. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, well, I, um, I was actually going to talk about myself, but I don't need to. Mia essentially covered everything. <laughs> so uh, I, did the, I performed a study on behalf of my uh, PhD program at Villanova. So I took, because uh, it's a dissertation, there was a lot of pieces to this and a lot of um, data that I collected. So I tried to pull out the most meaningful pieces that would be applicable here um, in healthcare. And I also wanted to uh, just mention uh, the other people who helped facilitate this, uh, this study and really support me and mentor me when I was uh, working on the study. So I had uh, Dr. Uh, Marianne Cantrell, she was my uh, dissertation chair, uh, Dr. Helene Moriarty, and she was my dissertation member, and uh, Dr. Bob Lustig, he is a radiation oncology attending at uh, Penn, and he really helped um, move the study along on the Penn side, and Dr. Uh, uh, Marianne Heverly, who helped me with the statistical analyses. So you will hear me uh, talk about a very specific app that I use and I tested, uh, but I have no financial ties whatsoever to the app or to the company, uh, so I have no financial disclosures, conflicts of interest whatsoever. So just a little background on uh, oncology. I don't know how many people in here have uh, worked in the oncology field. But for those of you who don't, according to the National Cancer Institute, I estimate about 1.7 million people uh, will be diagnosed with cancer in 2018. And approximately 40% of both men and women will develop cancer at some point during their lifetime. And an estimated 50% of oncology patients, they will receive radiation therapy at some point during their treatment regimen. So a little background on uh, mobile health apps, and I'm going to drill down more from this. Uh, so Mobile health apps are really taking off, as you heard Dr. Papa says. There's technology everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And mobile health apps have really been taking off because of the ownership of smartphones. And uh, in 2018, 77% of adult, um, US adults, they own a smartphone. In comparison to 2011, there was only 35%. 
And then as of 2017, I was trying to find a recent statistic for 2018, but I can only find 2017. There was over uh, 325,000 mobile health apps that are commercially available uh, for uh, people to download. And this is a huge jump from 2016. There was only 165,000 apps that were available for download. And most apps, they are geared towards uh, dieting and uh, fitness and exercising. And then also in 2017, uh, 3.7 billion people downloaded a, an app. And this was double from 2013, when there was only 1.7 uh, courses worldwide downloading an app. And of course, you know, got to end with money because money, money is important, makes the world go round. And uh, so the global mobile health market is valued at $28 billion. So it's definitely a lot of money there. So just drilling down for mobile health app, that's a very general term. So what does that mean? Um, so I studied a patient-centered mobile health tracking app. And you may hear uh, patient-centered, patient-facing, um, human-centered, humans facing back end, rear ends. You're like, who's end? Who are we talking about here? <laughs> so, uh, or you might hear end user. So like there's all different terms floating around. So just to provide context of what um, a patient center mobile health app is, is um, so when these apps are designed, it's supposed to be a consideration of the patient at every stage of the design process. What are their needs? Who are they? How can those needs be met through technology? And then um, these type of apps are intended for patients to monitor their own health. And this can be active, where they're physically putting information into their app, or it could be passive, maybe through a wearable. And then uh, these apps, too, are supposed to be designed uh, to facilitate the maintenance of health and the management of chronic conditions. So the significance uh, for my study in um, oncology uh, patients, especially patients who receive radiation therapy, if you're not familiar with um, treatment regimen, uh, most patients, they have to receive treatment five days a week for six weeks. It can be less, it can be more, but it is, it's intensive and it's a long therapy that they uh, need. And when they're going through uh, radiation therapy, they, the major side effect that they begin to experience is fatigue. They can have skin reactions, but fatigue that will start setting in. And of course, if they have concurrent chemotherapy as well, they can have other um, side effects. So uh, this type of app could be useful um, in this patient population. And so I went looking in the literature because I had these grand ideas. Of, oh, I'm going to look at engagement. I want to look at clinical outcomes. How can we impact clinical outcomes? I realized there's no literature out there taking a look at this particular patient population and if they're using these type of apps. And so they're, I mean, you can't run before you, look, you know how to walk. So I had to establish, essentially, if I gave you this app, would you use it? I got to start there because apps, I mean, they can be designed to do amazing things. But if no one's using it, they're not getting, receiving that benefit of it. So I had to back it, back it up to a usability study. And so that was my first step. And just essentially, if I gave you an app, will you use it? So the purpose of, uh, of my study was to examine the usability and acceptability of a patient-centered mobile health tracking app. And the app was called Health Storylines. Uh, and it was in a sample of adult uh, radiation oncology patients. And I know in the medical field, you don't use um, theoretical frameworks that often, but in the nursing discipline, we love them and we use them often. And because uh, there was just no literature out there for me to, or to support whether this patient population would use this app, I relied on the technology acceptance model and that helped provide the conceptual <coughs> definitions and operational definitions to help guide my study. Uh, so for the, and it's also known as the TAM, uh, so for usability, just to kind of provide context of how I'm defining them, it is the perceived usefulness of operating a particular technology that would enhance functioning, and acceptability is defined whether individuals use the app and the perceived ease of use of using an app platform. So this is a screenshot of the Health Storylines app, and if we have time at the end, uh, because I had a hard time with the hyperlinking, um, like I'll, I'll take down the PowerPoint and I can actually show it to you so you can kind of see what it does. Um, but for here, here's a screenshot of it. And uh, so this app uh, was designed for patients to record and track, you know, self-record and track their health. And then for my study, uh, patients or participants, they could elect to, to use any of any, some, none of the tools. I didn't influence whether they had to use it every day or multiple times a day or certain tools. It was whatever tools they wanted to use. So on the left-hand side screen, you can see the different tools. And um, they're all pretty self-explanatory, the exception of healthy doses. That's actually um, inspirational sayings. It could be funny sayings. I actually saved one that I thought was hilarious. And so if we have time at the end, when I 
show the actual tool. Uh, I'll show you the, the really funny saying that I, well, I thought it was funny. Um, and then the one thing, like I put yellow boxes around certain key pieces of the design. So on the left-hand side screen, that's a landing page. So if they open up on a desktop, they open up on their, their phone, they're going to see that left side of the screen with all those tiles. And I put a box around the, um, the plus sign and the red circle. And that's important when I started talking about the results because uh, this is a shortcut to the tool library. It doesn't say tool library. They don't know it's a tool library, but it is on a landing screen and it, it, there is no extra clicks to get to it. It's right there when, the, when they open it up. And then on the right hand side, that's the sub menu. So it takes an extra click to find that sub menu. Not all these tools were um, operational uh, during the study. And uh, so none of them that were tested, but I, I circled or put a box around the circle of support, tool library and to-do list. And just remember those three, because tool library is written out on this one, um, they are on a sub menu. So it's not readily apparent. There is a sub menu. It's an extra click to find that sub menu. So uh, just want to talk a little bit about protection of human subjects. So this was an outside app. Um, and I mean, I uh, work for the pen system. Um, uh, however, it's, uh, there's a lot of layers involved in ensuring you know, uh, patient safety. So the I, I had multiple IRBs involved with this. Um, so I had pen uh, or uh, pen medicine IRB that I had to have approval for. I had Villanova University uh, that was exempt status since pen medicine was the IRB a record. And then also because this was an oncology population at Penn, there is a separate oversight in IRB uh, for oncology. So CTS RMC that I uh, had their approval had to gain their approval as well. And because this was a piece of technology, it was um, from the outside. Uh, the Penn um, IT security specialist team, they were involved as well, vetting it, and they were checking for, you know, HIPAA compliance and just ensuring that uh, the high level encryption and protect patients' privacy and confidentiality. So once I had everybody's approval, then I was ready to go. So my research methods, I had, uh, or I um, used, designed a concurrent nest, nested, nested mixed method designs and it's just a really fancy way of saying I collected quantitative and qualitative data. And so my three data collection um, um, times, I had a uh, pre-app use survey. And so this was just to kind of see what, how participants were using apps and what kind of technology they were using. And then uh, my second data collection point was a continuous recording of digital analytics. And this was during the trial over two weeks. So anytime a patient opened up one of the mini app tools and put information in there, um, that was being collected. However, um, for research purposes, it was never content. So whatever information they put in there, I never saw. It was just if they used a certain tool, that was it. And then I had two weeks at, or after the two weeks of using it, then I had a post-app use survey that, uh, that was pushed out to them through um, the app. And also I emailed it to them as well. And uh, so that was a mix of quantitative and qualitative data that I was collecting. So my sample and setting, I had um, 60 adult oncology patients and they were actively receiving proton and or photon uh, radiation therapy treatments. And my setting was the Roberts Proton Therapy Center. And this is within the Perlman Center of Advanced Medicine, which is associated with Abramson Cancer Center and so she with the hospital, or uh, the University of Penn Health System. So enrollment, I have my diagram there. And so you can see I screen 93 and out of them 33, they uh, did not enroll. Most of them were, majority of them were not interested. And I will talk a little bit about millennials because they make up the bulk of that number, the young millennials. Uh, no smartphone ownership. I had patients who whipped out their flip phone or like, will this do? And I'm like, not really. Uh, it was really cute. <laughs> that was, and different, uh, cause I paired up with different physicians and they're like, people have flip phones. I'm like, they do. <laughs> and then I had, um, two people, actually one lady was really funny. She pulled out her smartphone and she showed it to me and she's like, I know to hit this button. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so I showed the app and she's like, I can't do that. And I was like, that's all right. <laughs> so out of those 93, um, I didn't consent for it and I enrolled 60 of them. And then as you can see, as you go down the diagram, uh, unfortunately only 32 completed all the three data collection points, um, which was a shame. I wish more would have done it. And I'll talk more about that when I touch on limitations. Uh, but so I ended up with 32 usable complete data sets. And for reasons, people who do, didn't complete all those data points, there were some people who just didn't trial the app. They didn't do the post app 
you survey. There are people who trialed the app and never did the post app use survey. I actually had people who never trialed the app, but yet they completed my post app use survey. And I was like, all right, thanks. And uh, so in oncology too, I mean, a lot of health issues going on. And so people did have to withdraw and one person did pass away from um, cancer. So I wanted to uh, show my sample demographics and uh, and I put it up here so you can see a comparison. I, I mean, I collect a lot of demographics, but just some of the big highlights. So you can see the truly the non-difference between those who completed the study and those who did not complete the study. You can see the mean age was practically the same. I had a pretty good range as well. Um, same with uh, gender. I did have a highly educated sample, uh, which was certainly not what um, I sought or thought would happen, but uh, I did end up with a highly educated sample. But they were highly educated on both sides, if they completed or not completed. But the the one the one big difference, because I did build a graph with some other uh, demographics that I collected, and at the bottom right, you can see early in the treatment, late in the treatment, and early in the treatment were, was defined as um, zero to three weeks, and then late in the treatment was greater than three weeks. And people who were uh, uh, later in the treatment, we're less likely to complete um, the study, which, I mean, I can speculate it may have been uh, likely that they're experiencing side effects, especially fatigue from radiation therapy. So I broke this down into research questions, um, that analysis discussion, and I pulled the research questions that I thought would be applicable to healthcare, because uh, I, for dissertation, boy, I had a lot. <laughs> so I, only, I, I pulled ones that I thought would be applicable, and I didn't want to scrunch everything together, so I thought it'd be easier just to tease out questions and discuss them. So for usability, um, so I, again, there was no literature out there saying, you know, if, if these type of apps are usable to this patient population, I have no idea. So I really wanted to see, well, what tools were the most and least useful to this patient population? And uh, so I, I took the the highest for useful and least useful uh, for the tool. So the most useful tools were symptom tracking, journaling, and mood tracking, which really makes sense for this patient population because they, they do have side effects. Uh, you'll hear cancer is a journey and journaling throughout their journey and mood tracking uh, in the literature, uh, having uh, developing depression during their cancer, um, well, when they have a cancer diagnosis and their treatment is higher. Uh, so they, they all seem to kind of make sense, you know, based on the literature. And then also they correlate to the higher usability scores as well. And because this was mixed methods, I did have qualitative feedback. And there's um, the themes that emerge for these tools being um, the most useful to them and having the highest ratings were um, they're most relative to their needs. They felt they were easy to use. They offer features not available in apps that they currently do use. And then on the flip side of that, the least useful mini app tools were the tool library, to-do list, circle of support. Those three were on that submenu. It took an extra click to get to it. They weren't readily apparent. Um, and those were three that all three of them were on that submenu. So, I mean, I can speculate that maybe it was a design issue. And these also correlated to the lower usability scores. And then based on the qualitative feedback, these mini, uh, mini app tools, they just didn't meet their specific needs or they were already using tool, these type of tools elsewhere, such as in a different app or in a non-electronic format. And then also the overall usability of the entire app platform was rated favorably. Um, and then when I was looking at the data different ways, uh, I actually uncovered a strong negative correlation between educational levels and usability score, which is opposite from what um, literature says, which I'm not sure why that occurred. So when, and it, it really was striking because it is significant on the findings that um, the higher uh, education levels, and again, I had a fairly highly educated sample, they actually gave lower scores versus people who had a high school degree. They gave them much higher scores and that's opposite from what the literature says. And so I'm not sure why that occurred in this study. And then these, again, because I had qualitative um, data as well. So the, um, on the left-hand side were the themes that emerged um, after I um, conducted a content analysis. So only certain apps were useful to patients. They felt it was helpful to track their, their health. They thought it provided good reminders. People felt they didn't use it that much. And another theme was customization is important. And that makes sense to tailor to what their needs may be. So my, uh, my next research question had to deal with acceptability. And so this was based on the digital analytics. So there are, there's no error variance associated with this. And so this was the most and least used mini app tools during um, the two week trial. And you can see on the left-hand side, the tool library was the most used tool. Yet they said it, it wasn't useful to them. 
and uh, they gave it a low usability score, yet it was the most frequently used tool. And I think this is because of the design. It was that plus sign that did not tell you it was a tool library. It was right on the landing page, and there was no extra clicks to get to it. It was right there. And so they were probably clicking on that and not realizing that they're clicking on that tool library. And so when I talk later, we're going to talk about designs and how they matter. And then the rest of the digital analytics, for the most part, they really did match up with what they were using, what they gave the higher usability scores versus what they weren't using, given lower usability scores. And as you can see, the to-do list and circle of support, they didn't use that. Again, that's on that submenu. It's an extra click to get to it. It's not readily apparent. They're not using it. Uh, so again, I, I can speculate that that may have been a design issue. So my next research question had to do with acceptability as well. And so I wanted to take a look at, does usage change from week one to week two? And I mean, I can definitely say for myself, and maybe you are the same way with a piece of technology. I know last year I tried to fit fit for a little bit and trying to track your food is tedious and annoying. I was like, who does this? Oh my gosh. And then I worked for a couple of weeks and then I kind of knew how much I was walking, how active I was and it fell off. Like I just, it wasn't cute anyway for you know jewelry. <laughs> so I just, I don't know, it fell off. And so I, and a lot of literature out there does support that as well, that people initially use some type of, you know, piece of technology health tracking app. They use it for one week, completely drops off second week. And so, and a lot of the um, literature is saying because no new health trends are revealed. So if they kind of already know where they're, they're trending at, they're just not gonna keep using it. So I wanna take a look at that. And uh, so if you take a look on, um, there's definitely a difference between the means between week one and week two. However, um, running a dependent uh, t-test, dependent group t-test, there was no significance between the two groups. It was approaching significance. And I know in research, we always want significant findings. That's so important. Um, however, this actually is probably a beneficial finding because people are still using it um, even in the second week, but it may have dropped off because maybe there was no new health trends revealed. But a non-significant finding in this context is actually a pretty good finding. And then my next question had to do with acceptability as well. And so when you read the question, you're like, well, that's a pretty simple question. And you would be right if you thought that. Uh, however, there's, again, no literature out there and uh, supporting if patients in this population would use this type of app. And also a lot of literature out there talks about user burden. And I'm sure you probably heard about user burden and cognitive load, ease of use. and so. Again, if, and I can speak for myself, if something's too hard to use, like when I was trying to like follow like what I eat, like that's tedious, like putting all the information in there. I was like, forget this, I'm not doing this. And so again, you could have an app that can do amazing things, but if it's too hard to use, people are not gonna use it. They're not gonna receive the benefit from it. And so I had this, you know, it was a simplistic question, but I did wanna take a look at, was it easy to use? And majority of participants felt it was easy to use, 81%. And then also um, taking a look at, again, using digital analytics, they, they used this app 711 times among those 32 participants over that two weeks. So they were using it a lot. Um, and like I drilled down to actually see like uh, usage. And I mean, some people were using it multiple times a day, but most people were using about once a day. And it actually was about the same for week two as well. They were using about the same amount of time. So people who loved it and used it all the time were still doing that in week two. So I did have exploratory questions. Um, and uh, so for this question, I really wanted to dig a little bit deeper and see if there were any type of, um, if anything was influencing app usage. So this was the entire sample that I took a look at. And my hope was to run a logistic regression, which didn't happen because individually they did not, they were not significant on their own. But I wanted to see if like age had any type of uh, influence on usage and gender and treatment. And this is a self percep perception of tech savviness. And none of them were significant on their own, so there was no point to run a logistic uh, regression. But I was trying to see what could possibly influence app usage, and nothing shook out on this. Another exploratory question that I had, uh, which is, again, this is very specific to this patient population, see if there were periods of time where they just they didn't feel like using the app. And this was, a, a, the data I collected was strictly qualitative. And so the themes that emerged were it's just too much of a user burden. Uh, they were too tired to use, which isn't surprising uh, with this patient population. They were too busy, which anecdotally, when I met the patients, a lot of them were middle-aged. They were taking care of aging parents. They had kids at home, and a lot of them worked, too. And you know, they had a lot on their plate. Other people just forgot to use it. 
And then my last exploratory question um, was just taking a look at what features weren't present that they felt would be really useful to them. And when I was recruiting patients, it's funny because I, you know, I show up with like my, my iPad and showing them and they would actually whip out their phone and show me apps that they like and tell me why they like them. And so I have like a nice running list in my head about different uh, apps, different features, like what they like, what they don't like. And so that was one of the exploratory questions as well to kind of figure out, well, you know, what tools, what features would be very useful to you? And so the responses uh, were a no tracker. Uh, another one was nutrition tracking with a calorie carb count. A lot of the, a lot of the patients that I spoke with, they were very interested in eating as healthy as they could to have the best fighting chance against cancer. Some were really interested in like tumor starving. And so they thought that would be helpful to them. Having a contact with their healthcare providers, um, having links to other apps or other platforms that they really enjoyed using, um, sending notes to their healthcare providers and mindful meditation. They were under a tremendous amount of stress. So uh, limitations for my study and, and of course, you know, I. I did have many, this was uh, you know, a starting point. Uh, so my sample size, I ended up with a high percentage of attrition. And uh, so I, I, I ended up with 32 complete data sets. I, that was eye-opening. I don't know why. I was like, oh, everyone's gonna wanna do all these pieces. And no, they didn't. So, uh, so I did have a high level of attrition and this certainly could have led to bias in my outcomes. Like who knows if five, 10, the whole sample would have completed all the data points, what my outcomes could have looked like. So it certainly could have led to bias in my outcomes. I also had a highly educated sample. Again, I didn't set out for that. Um, but I think this may have been related to my exclusion criteria. They had to have a smart device. Like they couldn't be a part of it if they didn't have a smart device. So, I mean, that could have contributed to my highly educated sample because they, they were highly educated on non-completers and completers. Uh, my survey tools only have face validity. This is an emerging field of study and there are limited established uh, reliable and valid surveys. And also because there is no literature out there looking at app usage in this uh, specific patient population, I really needed a mixed methods design. I needed that qualitative piece as well because numbers only tell you a certain piece of the story and those surveys are not to be found. So, but my, my tools have face validity. And also not all health tracking apps are the same. Um, the Health Story Lines app, it's very specific. It has uh, a certain design, tools, features. So if I would have shown up with a completely different app that had different interfaces, different designs, different features, then I could have possibly had different results. So it does limit the generalizability uh, to other um, app tools out there. So lessons learned, and I had many. Uh, I think the biggest lesson that I learned was maintaining contacts with participants. When I was writing the protocol, oh, and I, get, I guess I should back up too. So I, I work on, um, as Mia said, like I am, I still practice as a CHOP nurse and I'm actually now on the pediatric side of radiation oncology. And um, so like I, 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 because the sample size would have been small, I, I moved over to the adult side of uh, radiation oncology. And so when I was writing the protocol, I just know from the pediatric side, tremendous stress parents are under. Um, I didn't want to bother participants. Like they have a lot going on, they're not feeling well, they have a lot of side effects. So I wrote the protocol that I wouldn't, I have initial contact with them and then in two weeks after. And in hindsight, I should have at least one time checked in with them, see how everything's going, if I could help them with anything, maybe they were having tech problems. Uh, I think that would have went a long way to decreasing my um, attrition percentage. So that was certainly a big lesson learned for me. Um, also utilizing different healthcare providers to help me uh, engage with the app and that could have helped too. They could have been proxies for me checking in with them. And on the adult side of uh, radiation oncology at Penn, it's not the doctors, it's not the nurses that have con the most contact with these patients. It's actually the radiation therapist and they run the beams. They're the ones who see them every single day and they probably would have been the best people to check in with the patients, seeing how they're doing, being proxies for me. I can tell you on the CHOP side, it's actually, it's the RNs that see um, patients every single day. Radiation therapists see the, because I take care of real little ones that need anesthesia, so they see the little kids, but they're actually under anesthesia and they never see the parents. Uh, so it's, so it's you know, unit dependent who has the most contact. Also, I alluded to before when I said the no interest, so young millennials had no desire to be in the study, like zero. And I'm talking like the 20 something year olds. And I met quite a few of 20 something year olds that had a cancer diagnosis coming in there for treatment. 
And I would show up with my iPad and be like, oh, you know, I have this app site. And they're like, no. And I'm like, let me show it to you. And they're like, no. Like, I couldn't believe how I was shot down so quickly. And it was funny because I, like, I, pair, I paired up with different um, attendings and to me, all their different patients. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's a 24 year old. They're going to love it. And at first I'm like, yeah. And then I, cause they have a big workroom and I would come back in and they're like, how'd it go? I'm like, I couldn't even get two words out there. I said, no. And after a while, like, like everyone was kind of surprised. They really thought that they would eat this up cause they love technology. But uh, my speculation is that this is not how they use technology. And, um, and uh, when I talk about future research, I'll talk about a funny thing that I saw in a study, but so, Young millennials just shot me down, and I don't know if other people have had this problem, but um, they just had no desire to be part of this health tracking app study. Uh, and then also, uh, family members and caregivers, they were really interested in, um, well, participating in the study. And of course, it was written for the patient, not for a family member or caregiver, but they, like some of them actually pleaded with me, like, can I be in a study? I can help, I can do this. And, um, <laughs> And I didn't expect that, like they were very interested in being a part of this. And, and I think it would be great to um, have family members involved because as their loved one starts exhibiting side effects and not feeling well, maybe sleeping half the day because fatigue is a major side effect, that they can be the one tracking and, and help, you know, um, you know, managing symptoms. So I think, you know, family, like involving family members is, is important. And, and they certainly, at least in my study, they were very interested in it. And I think too, it helped them feel a part of the team if they you know, could have participated. So recommendations for future research, um, certainly evaluating the type of uh, mini app tools that would meet the needs of this patient population. Um, and uh, because customization is really important and to help like meet their needs and, and especially in radiation oncology, their needs are changing. And uh, so trying to figure out what tools would help meet their needs. <coughs> And then also studying young millennials uh, with engagement with a health tracking app and trying to figure out what motivates them. So when I went into the literature to try to see, because a lot of it is like college age kids and it's looking at like fitness, uh, but trying to look at like truly like health tracking apps with this, um, this age population, I found one study, which is really funny that, uh, so it was a mixed methods and it was taking a look at, well, you know, why or won't they use them? <laughs> And one of the big themes that emerged is that health tracking apps are for old people. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so uh, I just got to kind of change up the, sh the marketing strategy there. But yeah, so it's for old people. And uh, and they their motivation is more tangible. Like if they're going to be using these health tracking apps, they kind of they would like gift cards at the end. This is what this one study was uh, demonstrating. I, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, but, you know, figure out what it takes to motivate them and engage them and, and using these type of apps. And then also examining sustained engagement um, with these health tracking apps. And I mean, I'm sure you hear like engagement, engagement, engagement. What does that mean? And for me, I really feel like measuring specific engagement actions. Like what does it take? Who does it take to really have people using those apps and to have a sustained um, use with them? And so that could be, you know, who, whatever healthcare provider has the most contact with patients, maybe using them and having like a two-arm study where, you know, if it's nurses and they have a certain app and you have nurses that are um, constantly checking in with them and checking how things are doing with that versus another group where you give them the app and said, see you later. And, and seeing what does it take, what, what specific engagement pieces that actually, um, you know, make a difference. And then of course, once you figure out what tools they need, customized tools, what can, you know, move with them, and what it takes to engage them, then we can then we can start thinking about the gold standard of an RCT and hopefully looking at uh, examining clinical outcomes. Because until you have those other pieces in place, it's going to be hard to have a successful RCT because usage drops off. And so you need that engagement piece um, to keep them using it so they can hopefully have uh, examined clinical outcomes. So implications for healthcare. Um, so as I been mentioning through here, um, designs and features certainly do matter. I mean, in my study, it looked like that extra click really meant something that it, the sub screen was not, or sub menu was not readily apparent. Maybe they didn't realize it was there. Maybe the extra click was just one too many clicks to ask for, uh, but design and features matter. Human engineering, taking components of that um, also can probably help with um, designs and easy use and um, the mental workload. 
and uh, just figuring out from the design perspective, you know, uh, who is your user and what are their needs and how they can be met and leveraged with technology. And then, as I mentioned before, definitely specific to um, oncology patients is absolutely the change with the patient. So in radiation oncology, fatigue is a major side effect. And so maybe, you know, them manually inputting their information is asking too much. So maybe now it needs to um, turn into more passive data collection, or maybe they need more reminders because they sleep half their day away because they're tired. Uh, so apps really need, do need to change as people's health status and their health journey changes. It needs to change with them as well. and ha has to have that flexibility. Also age matters too. So what motivates a 20 something year old versus a 70 something year old to, um, uh, use these type of apps is important and investigating that. Um, health literacy too, I feel like I don't hear that too often, but as a healthcare provider, you expect your patients to have a certain level of health literacy they need to meet so they can understand what you're trying to tell them. Well, they need that for apps too. They need to understand why they're tracking, what they're supposed to be tracking, why is this important, why are you asking for this kind of information? So they're actually doing it. So they have to have a certain level of health literacy. Uh, so they do it. And then also interoperability of systems and devices. I know that's, you know, I know here at Christiana, like I'm new here at Christiana, but I know different systems don't talk to one another, the major systems that we have, um, and how it would be great if they all did. And I know with apps, a lot of them are standalone, standalone systems. And, um, and it'd be great if they could communicate with the EHR, which definitely would help you with utility and communication with healthcare providers. But I also think about it on the flip side. I do have a friend who is diabetic and he does not like to follow the rules. And, uh, you know, he wants to eat what he wants to eat. And when he takes his blood glucose level, every time he takes it, it goes right to the healthcare provider. And so he doesn't like to take it because then the healthcare providers know he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. So I think too, there has to be a certain level of privacy because maybe patients want to track certain things that they don't want you to know about. And uh, so I think there has to be some kind of balance with interoperability. I think it's great, but um, you have to think about privacy as well. Uh, so conclusions, and boy, I do talk fast, so. <laughs> Um, and then I can I can show you the app because I have it on the back end of this. Um, so uh, this study certainly contributed to a limited body of knowledge. Essentially, there wasn't any. And so this was definitely a first step to kind of take a look at if I gave you an app, would you use it? And kind of build on that and trying to figure out. So like some tools were useful to them. They certainly need more customization. And um, and now we can build, you know, looking at engagement and then hopefully, you know, down the line, looking at clinical outcomes. But it did contribute to uh, limited knowledge out there. And then also the findings to support that the radiation oncology patients, they did find this app uh, um, usable and acceptable. And, uh, and mobile health technology does appear to be a, an innovation that patients would, would use, especially for radiation therapy. And, and I have my references at the end. Do you want to see the app or do you want to do questions? Do you want to see the app? Okay. So here it is. It looks completely different on a mobile device because they change all the interfaces. But they can add different things. I put in here when I'm sick, I have to take Advair. Um, because it's on the desktop, you can see the sub, like you can see this. But actually on a mobile device, you cannot see that sub menu. It's hidden. Um, and then symptom tracking. I mean, they can just grab the slide bars, pull them. To, and it's customizable to whatever. Um, whatever they want to track, moods, it's uh, part of the NANDA where it has the different faces. Um, journaling, I don't have anything in here, but any type of journaling. Um, questions to ask, you know, and it, it builds all one repository. A lot of patients like to stool, stool one because it had pictures and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> they were like, all right, they're like, I'm gonna be in your study because of that. And I'm like, all oh, right. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, healthy doses. I'll pick on funny. Let's see if it's funny. That one's all right. Um, and then over here in my storyline, so it, it puts all anything you're tracking, it puts it all in here. And then so you can see like trends over time, whatever you may be tracking. And uh -oh, hang on. Moods, and then you can see too. This is this is the one I thought was hilarious. That I was so if I send you an email, that just may be my tagline because I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but you can like save them, and then it puts it all in one spot for you. Um, and yeah, so those were those were the highlights. So any any questions? I, 
I talked so fast. So I, I was like, oh, I was going to go on for an hour, but I like knocked it out in like 35 minutes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, did you talk with the, the company that created the app and tested any sort of market research, I guess, in the general population? They did. They worked with advocacy groups. I met them at a Connected Health conference when they were a startup, and they worked with advocacy groups to figure out what their needs are to help start building um, these type of mini app tools. And now they're up, like at the time, they, they didn't have that many app tools, and now they're up to 150 uh, different uh, mini app tools that they can use, and they can constantly, you know, change them, refine them. And uh, so they, they were a good research partner because all like the data I needed, they provided good clean data, and it was all encrypted, and we had to go through a lot of things. So I and open up the data and start analyzing it. But yeah, they did. They did a lot of market research. I was not part of any of that. That was all done no, pre, yeah, pre me. <laughs> I was wondering if you like kind of knew what they found, right? Was in terms of you know, with their, I guess I'm assuming they worked on this general population. They uh, I'm trying to remember what what specific groups that they worked with. Because they are based in Canada, in Toronto, and in San Francisco. I can't remember the because they did, they targeted certain patient populations first. I can't remember them off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when, um, I'll say at our cancer center, they signed up for a subscription that then offered something, not this one, but something similar mm -hmm. for patients and very little interest. So really? It wasn't studied. I mean, okay. You know, research stuff that they were tracking it. And um, just a lot of people were not Really? What it, did you notice? It was certain, um, like populations within the entire oncology oh, so population. A, a second question I have for you, because maybe I missed it. Did, did you describe in terms of cancer type and diagnosis? I did. I I didn't put it in. Like, okay. oh my gosh. So yes, I I was looking at their their diagnoses, the cancer yeah. type, and I just didn't put it into the demographics. But I I did. I I teased it out that way as well. So are these mostly people who are like earlier stage folks, or they um. Well, no, I mean, I had a pretty good spread. Yeah. A lot of them were um, uh, brain tumors, brain oh. and spine were, and they just seemed to be more interested in it than other um, areas in the body. But, uh, I mean, because some of them had, like, concurrent chemo, some had before, some had after, uh, but, I mean, of course, they were all receiving radiation therapy that I was targeting. And then the last thing you just briefly mentioned, um, passive data collection, which is something I've become interested in I don't know are you doing any work in that area or well so I, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what's going on here at Christiana so I can be tapped into the technology that's happening okay. uh, here but I, I think they're looking at passive data collection is important especially in this population and I'm sure you would probably agree that they're tired they don't feel well for them to ask them to put information in is asking a lot plus the data may be better right because you can track motion you can track sleep even absolutely so yeah more about them than I self report. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So it was interesting that none of them. Do you want me to go back? Circle of support. Oh, you want me to go in there? Yeah. Yeah, so this um, is. Do you, do you think that was an age thing? Like, do you think if you had that millennial group, that that's what they would have used because they used it to allow support versus, or you think it was purely a ability, like they had to click twice? I, because. I, I think it was a usability. I think because it was like, I mean, granted, this is not showing you how like on, on my phone, like if it's on the phone, you don't see that, you don't see that sub menu, like it's hidden. And it just, it was interesting that the tools that were operational on that sub menu, they didn't use it. And the digital analytics backed up. They didn't use it. So I don't know if it was, they didn't realize it was there. Or it was just one click too many. Like, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I mean, I can speculate. I definitely feel it was a design issue that maybe, you know, everything that's important has got to be right there, not landing page in their face, and they're looking at it, and don't make them hunt for it. Yeah, go ahead. I guess we're building this question a little bit. Like, I think people talk a lot about um, fatigue, like email fatigue, uh, option fatigue, variable fatigue. And you mentioned, I think, like, uh, storylines now is over like 150 different potential variables to measure in terms yeah. of more patients. So I guess two questions for you. So the first of which, and I think you mentioned, I think it was a symptom tracker that they were most heavily utilized mm -hmm. among your population as mm -hmm. well. Has that been true in other populations that have utilized health storylines? And then the second question which sort of relates to it is like, given you're looking at such a targeted population, are there certain needs among health professionals, like whether it's nursing staff, 
radiation therapists or even the um, physicians themselves among like the variables that they felt like would be more beneficial to helping them through. Does that make sense? Let me let me let me answer your first one. So as far as like the health storylines um, app, I um, when I met them they were a startup, so uh, they were working with you know, um, university. I don't know if it's University of Toronto, but they were working with a university for spinal cord injuries in Canada. So they didn't have like I didn't have this other data what they were utilizing during the time of my study. So I, like I. So I can't really answer like that first one, but based on uh, Liz, you're looking at oncology in general, symptom tracking. Because when I worked on my publication, like you know, you have to find our literature, support you know your findings, and you know, hash it out and discuss it more. And uh, oncology literature in general was very supportive of people who want to track, whether it's paper form or electronic form. They want to track their symptoms. They want a journal because it's a journey to them, and and moods too, which. I didn't expect moods. Like I was actually kind of surprised by that. And when I went digging into the literature, that is something for them to monitor. And then also I, um, I found a, a good study that was looking at uh, breast cancer uh, patients and looking at depression in them and looking at screening tools for them and seeing if it's higher um, as well. I guess sort of following up on a little bit, maybe, and I apologize if I missed this, but on the back end, like the storylines, can they communicate that data directly to the healthcare provider? No, this would have to be, the patient would have to show it to them. So have there been any surveys done of like healthcare staff who have patients that use it that like if we surveyed the physicians, the radiation techs, as well as the um, not, not that I'm aware of. They built out this platform um, and now they have something called doctor storylines where then it the information being tracked then moves onto a screen for healthcare providers to look at. But the, um, I just I just studied this. So I, I don't know too much about that but they have evolved their platform and added more components to it. Can, and then your other question is? Yeah, okay. no, I think it's uh, one of the things that you were talking about earlier that I think is really interesting is just like just the importance and what we as healthcare providers think is like what people are going to do with an app, like a healthcare app. I mean, you know, most people are like, oh, well, a young person is going to want to use it. I would think the same thing, but really going back to sort of the the design of things and how maybe it's gamified or whatnot, like mm -hmm. can engage people. And so, I, like hearing that you said for 150 variables, I mean, there's so much data that I think all of us want. But at the end of the day, like, do who's the end user of yeah, it yeah. itself and what they really want to? Yeah, and taking a look at yeah the design process and Absolutely. what their needs are. I mean, I think it's nice that they're. Um, or just any tools that there is a multitude of tools to pick from and then people can pick what you know what they need but i also think too they need someone to help them you know pick the tools go over and then and help with that literacy and then also there's a e-health literacy too so they really understand this is why you need to track this is why this is important and then so maybe they're a little bit more motivated but i mean this field is emerging so there's not much out there like there's small studies out there but there's just not enough to figure out like well this is what motivates you know this subgroup of this patient population, this age group. Uh, so there's definitely lots of work to be done, no doubt. And, and I think that sustained engagement piece that you sort of talked about at the end is critical too. That I don't know, I've heard a lot of conversations where it seems like they are like, give me the app, great, right? even if it comes back to me, but that there are populations going to use it. Yeah. And use it continuously through some without that continued, like, oh, did you use the app that you get, and having that good continued conversation. Oh, absolutely. Um, I wonder if you, you know, have to, you looked at one week, two weeks, but if you then have, like, the three weeks, four weeks. Yeah. You know, like, how long would you expect the population to use it? Because I, I was looking at the literature, and that's why two weeks was picked, because it's, after the first week, it drops off. So I, that's why we, we kept it at two weeks to kind of see well, what would happen uh, within that two week. But, I mean, it could have changed in three weeks. Maybe no one was using it. Uh, but I have to say, like, when I broke it down, uh, there were people who were using it so much. Like, they really loved it. I had one um, participant. She called me on my cell phone and let me know she loves it. And she's like, I wish I would have met you earlier in my journey. And, and I'm like, wow, okay. And so, and then other people, you know, in the feedback, they're like, this is a dud. So it definitely runs the gamut. And to understand, like, can you, like, identify the patients who are going to love it and then be able to target Absolutely. For them, and then maybe another type of intervention you know, that 
I think running different pilots to figure out like what works within what subpopulation, which age population, and then and then from try expand it out from there. But I, I think initially, you know, figuring out if I gave you an app, would you use it? Figuring out those tools, and then you have to figure out engagement because maybe they like the tools, but maybe it's too much of a burden to use after a while, or maybe because they're not learning anything new. Like, eh, who cares? It's tough. So you you have to have that sustained engagement, or RCTs are just they're they're not going to work. They're going to be done. You won't be able to figure out. The clinical, you know, impact it has. Anybody else? The negative yeah. correlation between educational level and average. Are there any clues in the qualitative data when you break out those comments by education level? No, no, there, there wasn't. I was like shocked when that, like that one, really popped up. But no, I, when I was going back and I was filtering and trying to figure this out, there. There, I, I mean, I, I couldn't glean anything for why they they gave it lower usability scores versus people who had a high school education. Which so no, I, no, no conjecture, no, no political. No, no. Did it seem like they were using other tools? A lot of them were using other tools. I mean, they were using other tools, but there was nothing really that stood out like with them, like a, like a trend or um, a theme that emerged with this subset of the sample, so I'm not sure. And it's opposite from what the what's out there in the literature. So I like what what, what uh, the heck. One report I've heard uh, from higher educated folks who are getting some kind of wellness support in their health insurance health or some other mm. pharmacy is the information is obvious and it's not value, there's no value added. Oh, okay. Uh, this seems to me there is value. In it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I didn't know that. Anybody else? All right. Thanks. <laughs>